everyone and welcome to this uh, second in a series of seminars or webinars on uh, nationalist extremism in North America. I'm John Shorchiari. I'm the director of the International Policy Center and the Wiser Diplomacy Center at the University of Michigan's Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. And we're pleased to be running this series as part of our 2021-2022 North American Colloquium, which is a partnership that we have at Michigan with uh, the University of Toronto and the Autonomous National University of Mexico. Uh, this year's theme, Nationalist Extremism, uh, will culminate in a conference that we'll host in person here in Ann Arbor in April. In the meantime, as I mentioned, we're in the second of our four webinar sessions on the theme. The first in late October dealt with the historical drivers for nationalist extremism in Canada, Mexico, and the United States. Today, we're here to talk about the current threat environment. And in the winter, we'll have further sessions on the policy tools and frameworks available and new, new approaches to dealing with and countering uh, nationalist extremism. For today's session on the current threat environment, we're delighted to have two panelists with us and a third who has submitted a, a video as he's unfortunately unable to be here synchronously. I'll start by introducing him. Dr. Leonardo Curcio Gutierrez is at the Center for Research on North America at the Autonomous National University of Mexico. He's an expert on national security and is the author of eight books, as well as the co-author of a few dozen more, all on topics related to national security uh, and governance uh, in Mexico and other, uh, and other countries. Uh, next, we have Dr. Stephanie Carvin, uh, who is an associate professor of international relations at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University in Canada. Stephanie is an expert in international law, security, terrorism, and technology. She's the author of the book, Prisoners of America's Wars from the Early Republic to Guantanamo from Columbia and Hearst in 2010, as well as the co-author of the book, Science, Law, Liberalism and the American Way of Warfare, The Quest for Humanity and Conflict, published by Cambridge in 2015. Among other things, Stephanie has worked as a consultant to the US Defense Department and spent three years as an analyst with the Canadian government on national security issues. Third, we'll have Dr. Cynthia Miller Idris, uh, who is professor at the School of Public Affairs and School of Education and runs the Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab in the Center for University uh, Excellence at American University in Washington, DC. Cynthia regularly briefs policy, security, education, and intelligence agencies in the United States, at the United Nations, uh, and around the world on trends in domestic violent extremism as well as strategies for prevention and disengagement. She's the author of the new book, uh, Hate in the Homeland, the New Global Far Right from Princeton University Press. And some of you in the Ford School community had the privilege of hearing her speak about that book uh, just last month. She's also, also the author of several other books, including from Princeton University Press in 2018, the book, The Extreme Gone Mainstream, Commercializ Commercialization and Far Right Youth Culture in Germany. Last but certainly not least, Cynthia is a graduate of the University of Michigan, both the Master of Public Policy program and the doctorate in sociology. So we are delighted to have uh, such a great panel. Uh, and I'm also privileged to have my partner in crime, uh, Javed Ali, a colleague here at the Ford School, himself an expert in nationalist extremism uh, and uh, a person with many years of high level experience in the US government, including as senior director of counterterrorism at the National Security Council and other senior roles at the National Counterterrorism Center, the FBI and elsewhere. So I'm going to turn over to Javid and he will moderate uh, today's webinar panel. Thanks, John, for that uh, introduction and great to be with everyone today. Uh, hopefully at one point we're going to have these in person and maybe we'll have to wait to April to get to that. Um, but uh, definitely, um, definitely great to have everyone on this for this session today. And John, as you mentioned, we're going to take a look at the current threat landscape and there's a lot of ground to cover uh, on that between Mexico um, Canada and the United States and that landscape seems to be shifting even underneath our feet. So even what we thought a year ago might be a, a little different from, from what the threat environment looks like now. But um, that's what we're going to try to get into with the panel today. And John, I believe based on the order of presentations, we're going to have the recorded session first, uh, and then we're going to have the um, 
the short remarks from uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Carvin and um, Cynthia, and then I will um, engage in a, a Q and A with them, and then hopefully we'll get some uh, questions from the uh, the audience as well. Wonderful. And with that, I'll share uh, Leonardo's video. Hi, good morning to everyone. I would like to express how deeply honored I am to share the panel with you, Dr. Calvin, and with you, Dr. Miller Idris. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Chorchari for hosting us and uh, for his kind presentation. I am, uh, know that it's not the proper way, it's not uh, the best way to participate in a panel, delivering my remarks recorded, uh, but sometimes it's impossible to deal with Eastern time and, uh, and uh, uh, Paris time. So sorry about that. I know I'm missing a very interesting debate. And uh, let me let me share with you a couple of thoughts about about the subject we are discussing. Uh, the current landscape is changing naturally. At the sunset of the last century, uh, universalism and cosmopolitanism were highly appreciated values. Globalization as a human project uh, provided a highly a highly optimistic framework to organize the international arena, to deal with global uncertainty, uh, to foster convergence, and um, uh, to, to build the basis for dignity, for respect, for, uh, to, for foster this uh, sense of belonging to the planet Earth as a common homeland. As a French thinker, Edgar Morin, said, we have to, 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 to identify our homeland as our, our, the planet as our homeland, la terre patrie. The first challenge to this wishful thinking was the debate introduced by Samuel Huntington. We belong to different civilizations. So it's preposterous to expect a peaceful world in those circumstances. No, we belong to different civilizations, we have different approaches, so we are in a certain way destined to, to fight. The second challenge was the identity, also raised by the brilliant yet controversial uh, Huntington. The, uh, the identity, who I am, who are we as a nation, is never an innocent question. Identity as nationalism is always a provocative way, it's probably elegant sometimes, to, to stress differences. We are not equal, we speak different tongues, we have different religions, we have different values, so we are essentially incompatible. We do not match. The national or the natural connection uh, between identity, national identity, and the daily life in North America, all the anxiety after the crisis, the financial crisis of 2008, is naturally migration. How can we deal with that complicated issue, which is, you know, emotional, highly human, we don't trust if we don't know each other, is highly politicized and is a driver for political polarization. The anti-Mexican narrative displayed by Trump and company five years ago killed, for instance, NAFTA. You know, the, the, the spirit of Houston was killed by this narrative. And by the way, this narrative empoisoned the atmosphere of the region. I am afraid, by the way, that it is not over. Probably in the election, in the, in the next presidential elections, presidential elections, the ghost of nativism will reemerge in America and in the region. Uh, allow me to share with you a couple of remarks about the Mexican reaction to this anti-Mexican wave. Mexico, uh, happily, uh, the Mexican response to this anti-Mexican wave has been mainly rhetoric. López Obrador, our popular and populist as well president, used uh, 
in a, uh, in a synergic way this uh, bombastic narrative to campaign, mainly to campaign. But once in office, his strategy has been highly pragmatic, even condescendent, if I may say. Lopez, as the epitome of the Mexican left, is not surprisingly anti-American. On the contrary, he is a huge fan of USMCA. He doesn't want to establish deeper ties with China. And he is convinced by the idea of ally shoring, near shoring. So in the left wing political spectrum of Mexican culture is not growing anti-Americanism nor anti-Canadianism. AMLO is not recycling the classic topics about uh, against, or against free trade, uh, classic uh, topics uh, uh, used by the unions and the left-wing party politics in Latin America. He considers that we are neighbors and we have to deal with that fact. The, le the leftist traditional narrative, though, it has some components that could have uh, disrupted potential in the foreseeable future. The narrative of Mexican nationalism is highly victimist. Uh, the classic approach is against mining and energy and oil. Next year, the electric reform proposed by the president could be could provide the ground for uh, a growing nationalist speech defending our sovereignty. Keep, keep an eye on that. And uh, uh, finally, uh, it's a, probably an old-fashioned ideology of national liberation, but it's in a very good shape these days. Our president considers Cuba not an, a stubborn and authoritarian regime, but a heroic one which is disturbing, but that the way it is. Uh, which deserves, by the way, he said, a kind of Nobel Prize uh, for its endurance and resilience. Uh, that could be, as well, a source of unrest for the region. But uh, I have been a little bit long, I know. I would like to apologize once again. Thank you very much for the, your kind invitation. I wish you an excellent debate. Thank you. So um, with that, uh, or with those remarks from Dr. Uh, Curzio, unfortunately he wasn't uh, able to be here, but I think he provided an interesting um, sort of macro level view on some of these key drivers and issues in Mexico. Let me next turn to uh, Dr. Carvin to give us the view from Canada. So, and I believe you have some slides you'd also like to share. So hopefully that function will work. Dr. Carmen, we're not getting sound from you. There we go. How's that? Good. Yep. Okay. Much better. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like that introduction where you said I was good at tech, you know, I study technology because I'm always <laughs> the person who leaves the, the mute button on. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. I was absolutely delighted to receive this email. Um, yeah. I mean, from the biography, I, I realized I need to update it a little bit. Uh, most of my work recently has been on violent extremism and national security threats, uh, mostly from a Canadian perspective, but also how they intersync with that of our allies. So this is a, a very interesting conference, and I'm happy to be here. So there's a number of observations that I, I wanted to make just from the get go. Um, and, you know, I had this actual interesting exchange with John just before we started, because um, the title nationalist extremism, I don't know to the extent to how how well that translates to the Canadian experience, because we have actually had kind of nationalist violence in the form of the FLQ, right? Like, so when I think of nationalist violence, that's kind of what I think of. Um, but, you know, yeah, it's kind of the what's called now, I think, ideologically motivated violent extremism or IMVE. That's the term that's increasingly being used instead of left versus right or nationalist or anything like this. It's just, um, it really refers to kind of a, a soupy mix of, of ideas, grievances, conspiracy theories that kind of come together. And I'll get to that in a second. Secondly, I think the important thing to keep in mind in the Canadian context is just how transnational 
or uh, these IMVE groups are. It's a very odd mix of importing and exporting of ideas and um, the Canadian movements in Canada have been heavily influenced by both uh, movements in Europe as well as the United States, but also Canada has exported uh, some of our some of our extremists to uh, particularly the United States. And um, finally, the way that the I think the biggest trend in Canada right now is the way that IMVE groups are intersecting with the anti lockdown anti public health measure protesters and so i'll get to that in the presentation. So the definition I use basically for far right extremism which kind of covers, I think, a lot of the IMVE, not all of it, but it's a starting place. It's the one here from uh, Perry and Scrivens, which is a loose movement uh, animated by a uh, racially, ethnically, and sexually defined nationalism. This nationalism is typically framed in terms of white power and is grounded in xenophobic exclusionary understandings of the perceived threats posed by such groups as non-whites, Jews, immigrants, homosexuals, and feminists. You could almost certainly add Islamophobia to that, uh, but it's not. that's not a comprehensive understanding. I mean, if you look at like um, some of the QAnon groups that are here now, I mean, they tend to be relatively diverse. Um, and the, those groups are being targeted by some of the IMVE extremists. So it's going to be interesting to see where that goes. Uh, in addition, a lot of the movements, which I'm going to list in a second, they tend to be imported and adapted from Europe. Uh, for, so for example, uh, Pegida, the Soldiers of Odin, although that group in Canada has like come together and fallen apart multiple, multiple times. Um, and then as well as the United States. So some of our first hate groups, like, like the KKK, the base, uh, it says Adam Waffen, it should be Adam Waffen. Um, these are very highly transnational groups as well. So again, not strictly speaking Canadian, but we're have that the scene here in Canada is kind of heavily influenced by what's happening abroad. But again, uh, Canadians have played influential roles in transnational movements, like, uh, and I'll get into that in a second, and then uh, in two slides, actually. But like, you know, today we think of people like Lauren Southern, Stephen Molyneux, even to a certain extent, Jordan Peterson, I wouldn't put him as a violent extremist, of course, but uh, certainly someone who is intersected with this movement in some not great ways. And, and uh, Faith Goldie, the Proud Boys, um, these are all individuals who are Canadian, who had big online presence, and um, in a lot of cases have actually tried to go to the United States in order to kind of try and make it big. Um, so this is how uh, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, our, our domestic, uh, I guess it's the Canadian MI5, if you will, um, this is how they understand the threat now. So the religiously motivated violent extremism would be things like Al-Qaeda and, and Hezbollah. Politically motivated violent extremism would be certain kind of separatist groups, uh, Khalistani separatism, for example, which has a, a very small presence in Canada. And then uh, IMVE, which they see as kind of you know, they, they kind of broke it up into four categories, uh, xenophobic violence, such so as racially motivated violence, uh, gender based violence is now uh, pretty big incel, the incel movement was actually, um, it's pretty big in Canada, we've had a number of incel attacks. And additionally, the term incel was coined in Canada by a Canadian woman, uh, not in a malicious way, it just kind of got hijacked. Anti authoritarian violence has been um, uh, pretty big since uh, tw at least 2014. And then you kind of have the the other right, um, which we'll get to in a second. So who are we talking about? Um, really, we've seen here the legacy hate groups, KKK, the creativity movement, again, started by a Canadian who had to go to the United States, though, uh, in order to really kind of thrive. But their ideas really still carry on. Uh, in particular, the creativity movement coined the term racial holy war. And uh, the, again, the symbols that these groups tend to promote continue to be influential today. Uh, secondly, we have anti-authoritarianism, um, which is again, this idea that government is Ill illegitimate, they rel rely on the misinterpretation of treaties or made up treaties. Uh, and again, they, they, we use the term pseudo law in order to kind of talk about the kind of, you know, ideas that they're basing their, their, their um, <laughs> bizarre kind of conspiracy theories um, on uh, there's a famous case here in Canada called Meads versus Meads, which coined the term organized pseudo legal, pseudo legal commercial arguments that are put forward. Um, again, a lot of uh, intersection with conspiracy theories. Um, with uh, anti authoritarianism, we also have, um, though, unfortunately, a number of shootings. We have a shooting in, in, in Moncton, New Brunswick. Um, we have the white nationalists, the Iron March legacy groups. This is a real concern, um, particularly in, in the current era, neo-Nazis, accelerationists, uh, the base, Adam Waffen, all these different kinds of groups. The Order of Nine Angles uh, actually uh, carried out a pretty horrific stabbing at a Toronto mosque last year, um, or a person associated with that group kind of um, 
sorry, satanic neo-Nazis. Uh, incel violence, which is, of course, gender-based violence, the idea that uh, there's a conspiracy theory against kind of beta males and that society has to be reordered so that every male can have a, some kind of female partner. Uh, Islamophobic anti-immigrants. Uh, this is, uh, again, this is slightly different in Quebec. I'm kind of speaking more to the Anglo-Canadian Anglo experience, but um, again, this is, uh, it, it, the, the anti-immigrant Islamophobic movements here tend to really be inspired by kind of European groups that are imported. Um, and then the alt-right uh, cultural chauvinists. So, you know, there's an America first movement in the US that's now, we now have a Canada first movement. Uh, really creative guys, uh, brilliant. Uh, we also have uh, the proud Boys, which again was started by a Canadian, that's now been listed as a terrorist organization. And something called wingism, which is kind of far right, youth driven, very meme heavy based graphic violence. So I have attacks. I don't really want to spend all my time on those, but you can see there's been a, a growing number of, of fairly serious attacks here in Canada. Um, and then, of course, we have the, the intersection now with anti public health measure networks, in particular, the far right. Um, so a lot of YouTube personalities or these protesters that kind of live stream their, I don't know, uh, kind of, you know, everyone's kind of ganging up on some poor pharmacy somewhere that's handing out vaccinations, certain po politicians that have made their, pardon me, um, their, their brand, uh, not particularly successfully, like no anti-vaxxer was, that's not true. There have, there are anti-vaxxers that were elected, but, um, not based on an anti-vaxxer platform. Um, and then again, we, this intersection with the IMVE groups that are trying, you know, that have shown up to these anti-vax protests that are in the forums that are trying to encourage this. And as well, we have uh, the religious far right, which honestly um, is just trying to resist a lot of these, but has kind of done well to network in far right Christian American organizations, mostly I think for the purpose of getting money, a lot of grift going on here, but that's what it looks like. And this is, you know, just some of the examples um, of, of these movements, which again, if anyone has questions, I could go into it, but it's an example here of, uh, you know, uh, the, the top right is the one of uh, uh, rebel media. They're, they're trying to get money for people to, to fight government measures. Canada first, this is the Groper movement that's based off of the US. Um, these were sovereign citizen pamphlets that were handed out by the so-called queen of Canada demand, um, a lady by last name is Dudillo, who's um, a QAnon influence, but kind of gone her own route now. And she's now encouraging her followers to uh, try to shut down vaccination sites. Uh, we have a politician, oh, sorry, that's a Hildebrandt there. He's a, he's a religious preacher who had his church shut down. Uh, uh, Randy Hillier is a politician who's been, uh, again, campaigning against these things. And then we see these kind of far right publications that are coming out against, um, uh, publication. So um, again, I see I'm kind of running out of time. So again, if I was to identify the concerns, it's really the kind of links between the far right and the anti-public health measure protesters. Uh, I put it here a picture. This is a report that we put out last week with the Institute for Strategic Dialogue with two other co-authors um, that goes into this in a little bit more detail if you're interested in, in what's happening in Canada. Um, but where does this go after COVID-19? Um, it's fractious links between all these different groups, but they've really built up some networks. Um, so these networks could turn to more traditional far-right issues. Um, if it's youth-driven, like we're seeing with the Canada First movement and the wingism movement, uh, it could, it's probably going to be done through the prism of culture and fighting to take Canada back. And anti-government movements um, can pose a risk to public order, as, as we've seen in a number of protests. So um, this is kind of maybe getting to your next series, so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I think there's a number of problems that we have going forward. One is I don't think there's still a good understanding of what this IMVE is in Canada. People were taught that terrorism is, is only Al-Qaeda for 20 years and trying to convince law enforcement to take this seriously is hard. So even when they do see these protests, it's they don't necessarily recognize the problem uh, for what it is or where it comes from. They just see a bunch of people like shouting about some person named Q and, and all these kinds of things, but they don't understand how this is all intersecting into a big picture. The third question is jurisdiction. Who is actually responsible for this is a really tricky question in Canada. In the US, it's kind of the FBI, uh, but in Canada, the jurisdiction's really, really messy. And I'd be happy to explain more of that if people had questions, but it's not immediately obvious who, who should be taking charge. And then finally, um, 
you know, borderlines. I, you know, I've talked here about preachers and things like this. I mean, they're allowed to have obnoxious, terrible beliefs. That's, that's their right. It's when they act on it. So it's not always clear when security agencies should be getting involved, if they should be involved at all, or if this is really just kind of a policy challenge. So I'll end my comments there. Uh, having provided that hop, skip, and a junk over the terrible landscape that is Canadian IMVE. Thank you very much. All right, uh, Dr. Carmen, thanks for, for painting that really broad picture, uh, a lot of diversity in the landscape. And I'll just make an observation, and I don't want to steal any of Cynthia's uh, thunder for giving the U.S. perspective, but just from the security service side, and again, being in the trenches in that my own career, I find it really interesting that, and I, I actually had a pretty good relationship with CSIS in my time in government. Um, and during my time, it was all focused on the jihadist threat, right? And those yeah. multiple conversations with my colleagues in Ottawa, uh, and when they would come to DC, we were really laser focused on that. But then CSIS puts out its public facing document on what this different sort of domestic terrorism threat looks like in Canada. And that came out last year. And again, your CSIS uses its own nomenclature and taxonomy. And then the US put its own uh, document out in March of uh, 2021 um, through the National Counterterrorism Center, which I also worked in uh, for several years. And that is the first public facing intelligence community product by the United States that lays out its framework for what this threat landscape looks like. And I'm sure Cynthia is gonna talk about that, but I just wanted to have our, our listeners um, understand kind of the, the difference in that and then where the US kind of insight from the intelligence community perspective uh, has landed. So with that, um, Cynthia, uh, great to see you again and um, over to you. Great, thanks Javid, great to see you. And uh, a lot of my remarks will dovetail really nicely, I think, especially with the Canadian perspective, but from uh, the things we've already heard. Uh, I'm not gonna use slides, but I will tell you a little bit of structure. I am planning to just make three major points. The first is um, to talk about the changing landscape of domestic violent extremism in the US in particular. Uh, so I'll talk about how things are transforming. The second is um, what we do or how we think about these broader threats to democracy, things that don't, don't traditionally fall within the realm of the extremist fringe, but actually are more in the mainstream. Um, so threats to election workers, more political violence kind of things. Um, and the third, I want to talk about solutions and sort of in that case, not just what we're doing in the U.S., but uh, what we might learn from some other countries, in particular Germany, where I spent the first 20 years of my career really studying these issues. Um, and of course, I want to thank uh, the Ford School and U of M in general um, uh, for being there, you know, for inviting me. It was great to be there in person, and it's great to be back virtually um, as an alum and, and uh, as a Ford School grad. Um, so really happy to be here. So on the changing landscape, just on that threat assessment issue that Java just mentioned, um, you know, in late 2020, DHS issued uh, the first uh, Homeland Security threat assessment that listed, um, that essentially said domestic violent extremism is the most pressing threat to the nation and identified white supremacist extremism as the biggest threat within that. After January 6th, the Office of the Defense, uh, ODNI, um, the Director of National Intelligence, issued a slightly revised threat assessment that is saying um, uh, sort of a split threat, which is um, you know, anti-government extremists or unlawful militias essentially represent the, the most serious threat to law enforcement, to elected officials, um, to the to government institutions, and white supremacist extremists represent the most pressing and lethal threat to uh, civilians who are members of targeted groups, essentially. So, so the slight split threat. Um, so it's evolving, right? And part of how it's evolving, the two sort of things I want to say there are that we're seeing um, an evolution from organizational forms of terrorism and extremist groups to what we call post-organizational forms, meaning that uh, it's much more a situation where people are radicalized online in more patchwork kinds of ways by encountering extremist propaganda, some of which comes from organized groups, but they are less likely to actually become card-carrying members of those groups, even as they plot and plan and enact terrorist violence. That means that the strategies, which I'm gonna talk about later, 
to address it um, when they have focused historically on monitoring and surveilling and infiltrating groups are struggling, I think, to catch up to what do you do about this post-organizational form and some of the more conspiracy-driven types of violence that um, you know, are, assemble sometimes into groups like Boogaloo, let's say, is a, what I call a mobilizing concept. It is a concept about, it's a code word for a second civil war. And sometimes groups form around that concept, but they don't actually always share ideological roots with other groups that mobilize around the same concept. So we had Boogaloo groups in the summer of 2020 marching alongside Black Lives Matter protesters in some cases, for example, because they saw a shared common denominator around anti-law enforcement. And in other cases, Boogaloo boys were opposing those Black Lives Matter protesters because they believed they were there to protect institutions or um, commercial entities. So they, they both, in both cases, they were mobilized by a concept around a second civil war or revolution or the collapse of systems, but their actually ideological roots are quite muddled or varied in other ways. So the concept itself mobilizes. We see that with Western, the concept of Western values too, where Western values is used, uh, particularly in Europe, so I'm talking mostly about the US, but by far right political parties have drawn successfully support from people on the left who uh, by arguing that Islam is a threat to women's and LGBTQ rights. And so this concept of Western values has drawn kind of a broader ideological support or the defense of ideological, uh, of Western values has drawn broader ideological support and drawn people to political parties that are actually anti-immigrant by making that argument uh, and rooting it. And so that gets to my second point, which is not only are we seeing post-organizational forms, but much more muddled and patchwork ideologies, and that's related. So, you know, you see these concepts that mobilize people. You see um, things like a white supremacist extremist group that got reconstituted late this year, with an argument that they are now a Bolshevik, um, focused on liquidation of the capitalist class, but as white supremacists. So they're anti-capitalism, white supremacists, pulling together two sets of kind of ideological motivations that typically have not come together. So an increasing cross-ideological anti-capitalism, an increasing cross-ideological environmental sustainability claims. So we see eco-fascism, for example, motivating recent terrorists, including in El Paso, who argue that sustainability is linked to closure of borders and anti-immigrant violence. Uh, is justified based on claims about sustainability and preservation of the land for white people. So racial entitlement to the land feeding into this, but still drawing people who are traditionally um, promoters of, of environmentalism, of protection of the land, of sustainability, of nature. There's a lot of merchandise and products being sold that are about nature and, and uh, nat the natural order of things. Um, as a justification for social inequality, for example. So strange kinds of eco-fascism and links and beliefs in nature as, uh, as a root for white supremacist thinking. Um, so we see that with anti-capitalism, we see it with eco-fascism, we see it with um, things like the Boogaloo, which get muddled ideological kinds of claims. So it's that patchwork type of ideology. So that's the kind of changing landscape. It's a mess. It's muddled, it's muddy, it's hard to disentangle. Um, much harder on, a, on the back end to use a security uh, frame to analyze, infiltrate, monitor, and surveil these groups. It's like a, a big amoeba that keeps morphing into new things. Making things even complicated, we now have this broader set of threats, this is my second point, to the nation that is not just typically the fringe, right, but really ways in which extremist actions or violence have moved into the mainstream. So we've been seeing uh, so many attacks on election workers, threats and violence and death threats that the Department of Justice late, in late fall announced a special task force to address it. Um, we have obviously seen January 6th spontaneously mobilized violence around events. Um, we have um, threats against uh, healthcare workers, teachers, um, school board officials, violence enacted that is political, that is anti-mask, that is uh, anti-vaccine, that's drawing people from, again, uh, a kind of anti-vax crowd, which has traditionally been anti 
science, alternative medicine, a little bit more leftist and hippie, bringing them into conversation with the, the uh, anti-government crowd and with the conspiracy crowd. So you get these strange coalitions of people showing up at protests who are gathered on what I call the, long, the lowest common denominator. So they're sort of assembling on the thing, the one thing that they agree on, even if actually their goals normally do not align at all. Um, and that landed us as a country on a global list of what are called backsliding democracies uh, last month. So some people may have followed that in the news. There's been a lot of analysis of that. First time we landed on that list, um, it's not a good sign for our democracy. And I will say that um, that group, it's a Swedish-based NGO that releases that list every year, uh, has historical data that shows it does take about nine years from the point a country lands on a backsliding, uh, uh, gets identified as a backsliding democracy to either collapse as a democracy or reconstitute itself in stronger ways. So, so it's not an immediate um, collapse, but it's a huge warning sign. And it really shows, you know, the, essentially the, as some people have, have argued and uh, who are electoral scholars, that the, the most important principle of uh, a democracy is the agreement of a losing incumbent to leave office um, uh, if, if, if he or she loses election. And we have just in the recent Marist poll released last week now, uh, only a third of Republicans even say that they would accept the 2024 election results if their, um, if their candidate loses. So we already know that the next few years are going to be a real struggle when you have, uh, and this isn't, you know, I'm not trying to make this a partisan issue, but the data, the polling data is partisan in this way. The Democrats weren't 100% either, but it was better. It was something like 70 or 80%. But it's not ideal, right? Ideally, you want 100% of people to accept the credible results of an election and not less. So, and that in some cases has led to tremendous violence. And I think we should anticipate it that it will in 2022 and in 2024. Um, related to that, I would say is also the rampant spread of disinformation, of propaganda, and of conspiracy theories. And part of that is also uh, the trouble that led us into backsliding democracy. So uh, I haven't been paying attention to time. Uh, Javid, do I have time to talk about solutions or should I should we stop and get into that in Q&A? Yeah, let's maybe pause on that, Cynthia. Yeah. And then I've got a couple, what I would call kind of icebreaker questions for both you and Stephanie. And then I will launch those. Um, covers in a way some of what you already said, but it'd be good to kind of pull out some additional sure. insights. And then hopefully we'll get some questions from the audience. John, is that kind of the, the plan from uh, audience participation? Okay. Um, all right. So great um, comments, uh, Cynthia. Uh, I think it's um, not obviously a one for one with Canada, but the same broad diversity of ideologies and organizations and groups and movements. And I like your amoeba analogy because that sort of captures the fluidity of everything. Um, so let me ask a question or two that kind of just digs into some of that. Um, and this, in a way, is sort of a step back from what both of you have just described. And um, it's almost asking you to, to pick up on where we left off in the first panel, but um, which none of you were on. Um, but to both of you, in what ways are the, the current threat environments that you both described um, so eloquently either similar or different to what that same environment in Canada and the United States looked like 10 or 20 years ago. So I'd be curious to get both of your perspectives on that point. I'm, I'm happy, go first. Go I'll, I'll try and go first. I mean, I think when I, so when I was working with the government on um, violent extremism, I, I remember the first time we saw this hit Facebook in a big way. And it was the murder of Lee Rigby in the UK, right? The murder of Lee Rigby in the UK was a giant kind of far right event on Facebook. Um, we saw there's the um, the EDL, the English Defense League. We saw the creation of the, the CDL, like literally just take any bad organization, just put Canada in front of it. And that's, yeah, that's how we roll sometimes. Um, so we had the Canadian Defense League a startup and like the number of likes that I got was huge and, and someone who was looking at this issue kind of started putting this out and we started noticing it kind of taking off so I would say about 2013 was actually probably the year that 
Uh, I mean, look, it's, it's existed online forever, but in terms of like it going from kind of like a movement online to a mass movement available, um, and, you know, I just really want to compliment some, uh, Cynthia on her presentation. I just thought it was wonderful. And yeah, I can see so much of it and it, it, in a big way. The other thing I'll note here is, is we have seen a really, again, um, the other, the other moment I would say, so speaking of 20 years, I would say 2016, the US, the 2016 election was like an electroshock in Canada with regards to, to thinking about this and the problems of online discourse. And then the other really big one was actually the Christchurch shooting. Um, I was, all of a sudden I was pulled into all these meetings about, you know, what do we do about this problem? And think, not that we've solved it, um, but, you know, I think, there, so I would say those three events seem to have really had the biggest impact. Um, and then in our election this year, which we had uh, in 2021, uh, the prime minister started to be followed around by some, some of these protest movements and some of these, he got people threw rocks at his head. Um, it was really the first time we'd seen stuff like that it was, it was gravel, but I mean, it was, it was not good. It's like, this isn't a very, a very, it's very normal for Canadian politicians to be able to kind of mingle with the general population. It's very normal for Canadian citizens to be able to walk around uh, Canadian public institutions in, in a relatively controlled way, but it, it's there. So it's, it's different. The last thing I'll say, sorry, is um, the one thing that I did notice uh, in, in every year now, our, our, our NSA, the Communication Security Establishment, puts out a threats to Canadian democratic institutions online uh, paper. It's the third time they've done this. And for the first time ever, they talked about the influence of the United States. And they said for every tweet that, or for every retweet a Canadian sends, nine of them originate in the United States. So the influence of the US discourse is so heavy on Canada. And the one thing we did have started to see is that importation of this idea of the big lie the idea that elections are not free and fair, that they're rigged, that all that kind of stuff. That I thought that might play a bigger role in 2021. It, it, it did and it didn't. Um, it doesn't seem to have caught on because our electoral system's a little bit different than from what you guys have. You guys have kind of this whole thing. Um, I'll just call it that. We our, our elections are, are very centrally controlled and we still use pencils and, and stuff like that. So it's a little bit harder to make those arguments, but I'll stop talking there. All right, Stephanie, thanks for, for that. Um, so Cynthia, any any perspective to add on kind of the step back view? Yeah, I mean, I... you know, what's been happening in the States, it's, it's hard to say just 10 or 20. I mean, really the white power movement is what Kathleen Ballou has called it. She's a fantastic historian who I recommend everyone read her book um, called Bring the War Home dates the, the shift really to the 1970s, where you start to see disgruntled Vietnam vets setting up anti-government kind of white power training camps. That led directly to Oklahoma City eventually. And, but then after that, we had a shrinking, a kind of going underground of the entire anti-government and white supremacist movements for lots of different reasons. Um, and then 9-11 happened. So what happened then, 9-11 kind of pivoted everybody's attention to the threat from abroad and the threat from Islamist extremism and terrorism. So when white supremacist hate groups and anti-government extremism and the unlawful militia forms started to grow, which started in 2009, um, when we had record-breaking hate group numbers and the constitution of things like the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters, uh, which was right after Obama was elected. Um, so, you know, this kind of backlash effect nobody was really paying attention. So they were growing. Um, it was really, so it, it really predates, but then when 2016 and 17 came, we had, um, I see people starting to pay attention here around the Unite the Right rally right after the 2016 election. And then Christchurch El Paso is I think what really drove um, congressional hearings and, and attention at the policy levels, leading then eventually to revised threat assessments. But the roots of it really go back a long time. So there's this balance between have, you know, what's changed, meaning I think what's really changed is that people are paying attention to it in the intelligence and the security and in the policy communities far more than they were um, even four or five years ago, um, but really only because of such shocking and tremendous violence um, that, and a changing nature of that violence. I mean, part of what Christchurch did was turn, you know, it was live streamed. And the live streaming of it um, 
really did shift and, and the global inspiration, I hate to use that word, but that is what really happened. I mean, he was inspired by Brevik and Oslo and then El, the El Paso shooter and others were inspired directly by him. So it's, you know, you really saw this kind of um, literal scoreboard in meme form emerge online with kill counts and with uh, labeling of saints and disciples and really trying to emulate these, you know, these, these terrorist actors emulate um, these other guys in almost like lone wolf form, so not members of groups, but inspired by this global um, grand conspiracy theory called the Great Replacement. So, and, and the Great Replacement itself, which is really important to say, got used then to attack Muslims in New Zealand, to attack Jews in, in Pittsburgh, and to attack Latinos in El Paso. So it became this really overarching, and then in, overseas in Germany and elsewhere as well, um, so you saw this really more ecumenical, uh, anyone who's other than white men were attacked um, with the same conspiracy theory. And that was sort of different than what we'd seen before. So, so there's lots of ways to look at the difference, but I would say the biggest difference is that people are paying attention. Um, and I'd like to get the, the uh, virtual audience involved. So please, if you have a question or comment, uh, if you can use the a raise hand function, please do so. But I also want to, Put an observation in and then see if either of you want to make a comment on that if we're going to think about a, a step back perspective here uh and i talked about this in the a class that I, I led this semester on domestic terrorism but if you actually go back to the same kind of starting point Cynthia, that you talked about in the sort of late 1960s early 1970s here in the us with sort of the beginning embryonic beginnings of this kind of new phase of, of the white power movement um we also had in the United States, which a lot of people don't remember, an equally lethal and hyper violent far left um, threat in the United States, which probably, at least in terms of numbers, conducted more attacks than anything on the far right end or the white power spectrum, um, which I just find fascinating. And they were both coexisting at the same time. Um, but here we are now 50 years later, and that very lethal far left threat doesn't seem to be present either in the US or Canada. And I'm curious if, if both of you also see that or if you think that has the potential to change or you know, is there potential to go back to the future of the 1970s where there were bombings and kidnappings and shootouts with law enforcement and assassinations from far left extremists here in the US? Yeah, I mean, that's, if you look at the Global Terrorism Index data, they have some incredible charts that show, you know, the, the, far left terrorism of the 70s in particular, all the way up to the early 80s, not just was equal, but far exceeded any other form of you know, political terrorism and extremism. So, and then it, it did start to decline in the 80s. And that's when you started to see this rise of uh, on the far right side of things. And I should say, I define far right as uh, two major things. One is supremacist ways of thinking that dehumanize. So that can be white supremacists, but also male supremacists, Christian supremacists. Um, you know, we've, uh, we've got a range of different Western supremacy. Um, so the Proud Boys fall into that as a Western chauvinist group, right? But also the anti-government side where you have authoritarianism and refusal to protect uh, minority rights and, uh, and, and rejection of freedom of the press, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it's, you know, that's the way that I define it. and uh, and. I would expect us to see significantly more far left terrorism in the years to come. One of the things we're seeing is rising accelerationism, which is an ideologically agnostic tactic or strategy that is applied equally and, and growing on all sides, which is a, sort of like a burn it all down mentality. It is about um, collapsing the existing social and political uh, and economic order. So it is a tactic that's used by anti-capitalists, but also by anti-government extremists. It uses, it sees violence as the best means to uh, collapse these systems that will later be reconstituted. And the way you reconstitute them varies depending on what group or, or you know, ideology you're talking about. But we've been seeing that rise across the political spectrum and also then bring, come together in these weird ways, like the white supremacist Bolsheviks who are arguing for the liquidation of the capitalist class, right? Um, so I think we're going to start to see the eco-fascist, like weird coalitions that don't make sense. If we think in traditional binary left-right um, spectrums, we have to really start looking at this in a more three-dimensional way 
where we can visualize these strange comings together and overlaps that have, you, you can see it when you start to see in their logic, why it makes sense to liquidate the capitalist class. Like you can be a white supremacist and be anti-capitalist at the same time, but that's gonna draw people to get, you know, to them from other kinds of movements. And so I think same thing with anti-vax and anti-government extremists, they're coming together on one common theme or denominator, even though they're actually, the rest of their goals don't align. So I do think we're gonna start to see, I'd be surprised if we didn't uh, start to see more political violence and terrorism coming from both these strange, strange new kinds of coalitions and, and, um, and also just more from what we had been seeing in the 70s and early 80s, whether that's environmental or anarchist or animal rights or anti-capitalist. Great, thanks for that, um, Cynthia. Stephanie, anything um, from the view in, in Canada? Yeah, I mean, this is a really interesting question. So I, sorry if you hear my dog, he, he also has views. Um, but, um, you know, there's this Canada, particularly in the 60s and 70s, I've heard it described as the hotbed of social rest. Um, we really, we didn't have a kind of traumatic experience like Vietnam that radicalized a lot of people, right? Like we didn't have that. So um, in terms of like far left, we actually had like kind of like small far right movements, the Edmund Burke Society, the creativity movement comes out of the, the 60s and 70s on the far right. Um, but in terms of the far left, I mean, uh, yeah, there were some protests. Um, the biggest is it's almost certainly, like I mentioned at the beginning, is the FLQ, the, the Front de Liberation de Quebec. But that was so unpopular what they did. It actually hurt the cause of sovereignty uh, to a large extent in Quebec. And I think they realized that, no, doing this is stupid. And so it lasted for two years. Uh, the people who were involved in that movement, it, it killed one person. Um, they fled uh, to Cuba, but then eventually they came back, served their time, and they're now free. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, we had in the 80s, like there were some um, anti-apartheid movements. They, they poisoned some there. They, they claimed to have poisoned some South African wine. Uh, there was this, a group called the Squamish Five, which did actually try to attack, I think, a hydroelectric plant. They blew, oh, they firebombed a bunch of pornography stores. Um, but, you know, so it, like the kind of like far left violence hasn't really existed in Canada. Um, the most recent thing you could possibly say was a group called Resistance Internationaliste, um, which is out of Quebec. And they bombed a hydro tower, which kind of made it lean a bit, um, but didn't fall over. They did bomb a um, uh, Canadian Armed Forces recruitment center and as well as the car of an oil executive. So, uh, and then they've kind of disappeared. They were infiltrated by the RCMP who then blew the investigation, shocker. Um, and then um, you can laugh, uh, Javid, because you know what I'm talking about. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, it's like a whole other conference we can have. Um, but yeah, so what we're seeing now from the left in Canada is really disruptive protest, but not what I would call extremist violence. So the big issue right now is uh, people taking over railroad tracks and, and putting uh, encampments on railroad tracks. Um, that to me isn't extremist violence. It's a pain in the butt maybe if you're trying to get from one place to the other, but it's not that. I think should resource extraction issues become a bigger issue in the next couple of years, I think COVID kind of maybe deflated it. Uh, there could be some more extremist violence from the left. We, we really aren't, to my knowledge, seeing these movement. There's something called Deep Green Revolution. Um, again, didn't really see a lot. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, there is a movement, however, I think, in kind of more conservative political groups to list Antifa. Uh, I don't know how you're ever going to list them as a terrorist organization. I just, I just, it's just not going to work. Um, but uh, there is that movement. And I do worry that some of this more disruptive protest will be considered violent extremist activity, um, which I think in my view would be an abuse of terrorism laws. Yeah, thanks for that, Stephanie. And um, again, we haven't seen this manifestation of this ultra violent far left extremism yet, but I agree with Cynthia that it has the potential to go in that direction uh, down the road. John, you've got your hand up and I know there's a question in the, the chat box as well. Thanks, yeah, I, I would love to ask a question. Uh, thank you, first of all, Cynthia and Stephanie for those great presentations. My question is about the, the demographic uh, evidence available about violent extremism. Uh, in my first encounters with this in the United States, the image I and I think many other people had was something like Timothy McVeigh. You've got some military aged white male who's a little bit down and out economically and not terribly well educated from a rural or area or an exurb. But the January 6th protests 
uh, challenge that a little bit. Uh, I think it's been striking to some people how many of the folks involved in that movement and that activity uh, are people who have uh, spouses and children who are professional employees and so on. I wonder what you could say about in, in Canada and the US respectively about what we know on the uh, on the demographic profile of the people who are becoming involved in nationalist extremism, when they typically, what age is it typical that the people get involved and what are the sort of socioeconomic and other aspects of the profile that we should be aware of? Well, historically in the US, it's a great question because it, and it's a great observation. It's absolutely true that these things are really different. The way I answer this right now is really different than how I would have answered it two years ago, a question about demographics. So, Historically, it's youth, meaning, and you know, I define all the way up to age 35, men under the age of 35 who are, um, who are most at risk for violent expressions of extremism and terrorism. Um, the, that's where the data shows in the US, um, but also in, in a lot of other places in the world, on the, especially on the far right side, but in general, uh, across terrorist ideologies, youth are more prone to violence. That has changed, not just um, because of January 6th, but all of the political violence, all of that strange political violence and the odd coalitions that I've been talking about uh, that have really started even predating the pandemic itself just a little bit. The first major alarm bells that started to go off in my head were actually January, 2020, with the 22,000 people showed up to protest second amendment rights in Richmond, Virginia. And luckily nothing happened, but these heavily armed, incredibly heavily armed people um, showing up in large numbers, it was, it was so clear it could have gone wrong. And that kind of risk of spontaneous violence, I think is, is really high right now, whether that's with vehicle rammings or with you know, shooting, someone hears something that sounds like a backfiring or one shot goes off and then all of a sudden you have a real bloodbath. And so the those kinds of things um, are drawing much older people and conspiracy theories like QAnon are drawing much older people and more women and more women from strange demographics like the wellness and the yoga communities who are rooted again in this um, alternative medicine space that rejects a lot of science and then rejects authority and uh, has made them a little bit ripe for manipulation in the conspiracy space. So one of the thing, anecdotes I often tell is um, where I really started to feel this was I spent a lot of time talking to folks in the media and you know most of my life I've been talking about what parents and teachers can be doing to to address youth radicalization and in the late summer of 2020 I fielded my first question the first now of many from Teen Vogue about what could they tell kids who were calling them and writing to them for help with their parents who were radicalizing and you started, it was such a shocking question for me that, you know, it, it was a moment where I realized like, this is, we're, we're entering a whole different world, these, these kids, you know, and of course my advice is also really different than it is for parents. Like 15 year olds deserve a childhood and deserve safe adults. You know, it's not their job to fix their parents. Um, you know, I have a really different set of advice for, for, for parents on what they can do and who they should go to for help, et cetera. But, kids need to find another safe adult. So if you know a kid like that out there, you know, it's find a better resource. You know, it's not your job to, to try to fix your parents um, and, and you're in an unsafe environment if your parents are radicalizing into a violent movement. But um, so that's, you know, that has definitely changed. And we saw that on January 6th, we've seen that in state capital protests, we've seen it on the unlawful militia side, we've seen it on the conspiracy side. The white supremacist extremism side, I think we're still primarily seeing uh, younger actors be the ones who are responsible for violence, but um, that could change. We're not sure. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I would say too much that was different. I will say, like again, I talked uh, briefly in my presentation about this woman Romana Dudillo, who is uh, the self-proclaimed Queen of Canada. Um, and I, I don't know if I should say that I'm watching her live chats. Let's just say I've, I've seen them. Um, and uh, you know, that's actually a disturbing thing because she, she's gone from posting to actually interacting now with her her followers in kind of a very cult-like fashion or new religious movement fashion um and um you do you do worry about that but i mean uh, often she's just providing life advice to these people and she's just telling them that you know they're going to be okay uh there was a woman you know she was 33 years old and she's like i've lost all my teeth 
you know, when the new order comes, am I going to get my teeth back? And she was like, yes, you're going to get your teeth back. And, you know, like these kinds of things, like, I mean, it, and, and a lot of these people are older and they're trying to find out like, you know, this whole straw man theory or, and, and Sarah or whatever it is, the, the getting the, the, the whole money, the fake bank account theory. I think you simply, you know, and talk about, um, you know, that, 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 you know, their promises of money, curing illnesses and things like that. And this is really appealing to the baby boomers, right? Like this is, this is what they want. This is what they think is coming. Um, but yeah, there's this also, uh, with, there's a group here in, in, in Canada called, uh, anti, anti hate, uh, Canada, they call it fash wave, which is this, um, kind of really almost punk aesthetic, but with fascist overtones, um, and that, that they push forward. And I think what we're seeing, so on the youth side, we're seeing kind of, I would say almost like the Facebook driven social media kind of me, you know, January 6th style stuff. The youth are, I think they're, they're smart. They're in it. The, yeah, okay. You occasionally get the unite the right protests, but generally speaking, you're all, these are people who understand um, that they have to subvert conservative movements in order to bring about the kind of change that they want, and that's what they're working towards. And they're they're sticking uh, to things like memes, and they're 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 the drum they're going to beat the loudest is cultural. And in parts of Canada like Quebec, that's going to have huge resonance, and that's that's a concern going forward. Thanks, um, Cynthia and Stephanie, for those insights on John's question. We have one question from the chat. Uh, Elena, I can turn it over to you if you're still on, or I can read your, your question. So I'll give you a second to, to unmute if you want to jump in. Elena, you're still on mute, so. All right, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna, uh, I'm going to uh, just read the question um, from Elena. So uh, her question is, what is, so what is more dangerous for society, uh, open violent acts or uh, deeply hidden violent thoughts? So I think I kind of understand the gist of the, the question there. Yeah, I can try to take a stab at it. I mean, the US government, um, so answering this for the US side, the US government has um, very much focused on the violence, on the physical violence uh, aspect of um, extremism and terrorism. So even when you look at the tiny bit of prevention resources that are provided uh, by the federal government, which is in the Department of Homeland Security, they use, they, they do talk about prevention of radicalization, but it's always paired with violence. So it's radicalization to violence, right? So they're very careful for good reason about not being accused of or feeling like they might be in the business of policing ideas or ideology. And that I think in the US context around protection of the First Amendment and free speech is incredibly important. What I have been urging them to consider is that there are precursors to violence that are really important for us to combat in terms of protection of democracy itself um, that, that can create the fertile ground for violent ideas and ideologies to, to happen. And that includes things like disinformation, propaganda, um, conspiracy theories, persuasive tactics like scapegoating and fear mongering that we can do more on the education side and we should be doing more on the education side to build digital literacy, and media literacy tools and ways to work within communities and fund communities to create their own models and tools for, um, for working across the age spectrum. You know, I used to say from fifth graders to 50 year olds to get back to John, uh, demographic question and an editor told me yesterday, I have an op-ed coming out tomorrow that talks about this. We should change it to eighth graders to 80 year olds. Um, so, because you know, everybody over 50 is not immune to this, which tells you a little bit about where we are and the demographic uh, issues. So, you know, that we need this across the life course, basically. And so, and that's not just about violent ideas, um, but about the spread of things that are really dangerous, I think, to the undermining of democratic norms and practices. So, um, that, that's, it's been tough for the US to adopt that, but there are other countries, you know, again, in Germany where I spent much of my career, this is the, the defense of democracy approach that argues that actually the best way to combat an extremist fringe is by equipping 
the mainstream with the tools to be resilient against it. Um, that you actually have to strengthen the mainstream against the overtures that will always come from the fringe. You can't eradicate that fringe. They'll always be there. And part of the task of ensuring a healthy democracy is strengthening the mainstream from within. So it's a different approach. It means thinking more about resilience and less about risk, or in addition to risk, it, you know, investing in resilience. Um, and it's something that the US really hasn't done, I would say, at all. Our model of prevention is the prevention of violence, which as I have often argued, means that our model of success in terms of the prevention definition is about how equipped we are to barricade the door. Um, and it's called secondary prevention, it's bystander training, it's training for the security guards uh, at the doors of the synagogue. Um, it's how well we are prepared to thwart a violent attack. That's usually how prevention is defined and understood. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, but I just don't think it should be our measure of success and that we need to be having more conversations with different agencies, with the Department of Ed, with the Department of Health and Human Services, with social workers, with mental health counselors, teachers about more primary forms of prevention as well. So in Canada, we are structurally slightly better off. By the way, I thank you for this question. It's kind of what I was getting at when I was like, what's the borderline here, right? Like where, where does the freedom of expression end in the national security risk begin like that this is a this is an issue um i think from the canadian perspective we're slightly better off because we have been well first of all um we have an, a, a dedicated department to canadian values right which is the uh, department of um canadian heritage and uh for for years i think well canadian heritage was basically founded because no one knew anything about canadian history because uh it's canada it's boring it is weird um so we actually start but they actually have the values mandate so you know i always tell students i'm like i mean like if you're interested in disinformation encountering it don't don't work at CSIS. you want to work at canadian heritage um because that's where that's where these discussions are actually that's where the policy solutions are being held so that helps in some ways that you actually have a body now the problem is that has to be informed by national security and we're kind of trying to learn how to have that conversation between the two bodies um we also have something called the Canada Center. Um, the full name is the Canada Center for Countering Violent, no, Canada Center for Community Engagement and Countering Radicalization of Violence, the CCPEVE, which sounds like some kind of communist volleyball team, but it's, uh, so it now just goes by Canada Center. And they spend a lot of time um, researching um, prevention uh, in the space. They actually work with the, the, their big counterpart in the US state, in the US, I believe, is the National Institute of Justice. Um, so they do a lot of work there. Um, but yeah, I mean, so they've actually set up programs for people who like they, sorry, I should say they fund programs in communities that are for people who may be going down a path that that's not great. Um, and so it, it traditionally was set up for, uh, I have to say the religiously motivated violent extremism, but is now increasingly it's for the far right, like it's predominantly the, the number one client base now in Quebec is 100% the, the far right. So um, we have some of these programs in place. Um, they are not compulsory, but they are at least a path that you can offer people uh, and their families in terms of how to potentially deal with this. Um, we have very few metrics on how successful these kinds of programs are. But uh, it is at least something that we have and we can evaluate hopefully more in the future and, and look forward to. So um, as to the question, what's more dangerous? It's, I would say the violent extremism is, is always gonna be more dangerous. You have the right to hold obnoxious views. Um, it's the, the problem is when you act on it, but as Cynthia correctly states, there's a lot more we should be doing in the prevention space using a public health model, not a national security model in order to, to try and, and counter this threat. And I'll just kind of, jump in and my own personal um, experience in, in government. I mean, this was an issue that we just spent so much time on uh, in the years I was in government from post 9-11 to the late 2010s, mostly or almost exclusively again on the jihadist side of, of things. Um, and it was just, uh, you know, fits and starts along the way. We were a lot of hardworking, smart people, big ideas, but we just couldn't sort of get a program together to do more on the prevention of jihadist extremism. And maybe I think one of the lessons was this might not be a role for the federal government, right? This is probably something that, that other kind of stakeholders can, 
can are better equipped and maybe the best role for the federal government is to fund these programs and and let them deliver the the programmatics or the content or, or whatever but yeah to to try and have the folks um formerly folks like myself kind of on the hands of the steering wheel for this it just wasn't uh didn't lead to the. Can the I just add to that really quickly? Because I think I think it's a really good point, and I think there's two things that are different now. One is that um, so I, I totally saw that happening before, and I think one is that when the threat was primarily seen through the jihadist lens, the prevention landscape was so much more fraught with issues of targeting and with civil rights and the fears of of um, of uh, scapegoating communities who were themselves members of targeted groups and vulnerable. When we're talking about the threat coming from within, you know, ordinary citizens across, like not just white Americans, but we really have a wide variety, like a huge problem with people believing disinformation and propaganda and not accepting election results, et cetera, et cetera. So to me, it's easier now. I think if you just sort of say it's everybody, we don't have to target particular groups. We need it for everybody. We need it for early on. And the other thing I would say is like, I'm not, I totally agree with you. I think that part of the problem is that the federal government, one, it should be funding it, but the federal government historically has not had a very good multi-sector um, engagement of experts on the subject. So it's not like other federal governments are able to do it, but they involve like in Norway, it's a dozen agencies involved in their um, counter, uh, their, their domestic violent extremism you know, strategic plan. In Germany, I think it's nine agencies. So, you you know, we pretty much situate it in the, in the security space. And then we have trouble coming up with prevention ideas because those aren't the experts. You know, we need people who are, and I say this as a professor of education, you know, that I'm usually the only person in these rooms who comes from an education background. And so then it feels more glaring. Like we just need more ideas in the room coming from other agencies. But maybe it is just, you know, an issue of funding and leaning, leaving it to local communities. My fear is that then those local communities will do the same thing, which is situated in law enforcement and security and local FBI offices, rather than leaning into therapists and social workers and youth workers and teachers and counselors. Stephanie, anything? I know uh, we are uh, almost out of time, so. I just want to highlight, yeah, I think one of the major flaws of our CBE programs as they have been introduced, a lot of them are affiliated with uh, law enforcement um, which may make people le more families less reluctant to go ahead with that. Um, and uh, also like the RCMP is not the best counter, it's, they're not great at it. Um, so that's the other problem too, is they don't have, as you say, the right expertise. They should be, it should be more of a public health thing. The better models I think are the ones in Quebec, which are like psychologists and, and clinicians and they and they do bring all these those different um local actors together to design specific programs for people that takes a lot of time a lot of money and it's resource intensive yeah and it took us a long time the fbi to realize you know the bureau probably shouldn't be leading this mission um it, you know it's got other priorities but prevention and cv is not one of them um okay john i will hand the mic over to you uh, but thanks cynthia and stephanie for being with us hopefully we'll get to See you again um, next spring as well. Yes, thank you very much for those great presentations and, and responses to the questions. Uh, we're delighted to be able to, uh, uh, to have two more uh, webinars of this kind in our series on January 10th. Uh, we'll have one at the same hour on uh, policy tools and frameworks for countering uh, nationalist extremism. And on February 11th, we'll have our fourth in the series on new approaches to the topic. And so we hope that you'll all come back to join us uh, and also look forward to an in-person uh, colloquium in April. Thank you all very much. Have a great day.